All right, this is Chapter 4, Slavery, Freedom, and the Struggle for Empire to 1763. Uh, here we see an image of the lower deck of a, of a slave cargo ship where the uh, slaves are tightly packed into the uh, lower compartment, uh, resulting oftentimes in up to 50% death rates on some of those trips. Um, so this transatlantic slave trade, uh, nearly 8 million Africans were transported uh, between the years of Columbus up until 1820. And it was an integral part of world commerce. Uh, the slave plantations contributed greatly to the British economic development as well as the economic development in the South and the North. Um, and other countries are going to benefit as well. The French, the Portuguese, the Spanish, the Dutch, all uh, profiting off of, of the slave labor. Uh, triangular trade routes crisscross the Atlantic Ocean, uh, bringing products back and forth such as tobacco, indigo, sugar, of course, slaves, uh, manufactured goods made their way from Britain, and the slave trade is going to foster the growth of banking and shipbuilding. Uh, it's going to finance the early Industrial Revolution and immense profits to be had, of course, to the detriment of the Africans. Um, so the Africa and, and the slave trade um, is going to inflict uh, problems between the African societies that are dealing with slavery, some of them profiting off of it, some of them uh, working with the Europeans. Um, the loss of tens of thousands uh, to the slave trade is going to weaken West Africa's economy and society, which will have um, tragic uh, repercussions even later. And of course, um, nearly half a million slaves, if not more, uh, made their way across the Atlantic Ocean uh, in the horrific Middle Passage. Uh, Alauda Equiano, if you have an opportunity, check out his, his book about his life as a slave and then uh, free after, very powerful. Um, and here we can see which parts of the Americas many of the slaves headed. Surprisingly, only 4% made their way to North America. Uh, but of course, slaves uh, having birth uh, in the Americas contributed to the growing number of, of slaves, which will reach 4 million by the time of the uh, American Civil War. Uh, in the Chesapeake rage region, um, there was a, a hierarchy of of, uh, of society set up. You know, the large plantation owners were at the very top. Uh, your lesser plant planters and landowning Yemen uh, were below them. Um, even lower were your servants, your tenant farmers, your convicts, and then of course the lowest were the slaves. Um, and then race became a significantly growing uh, social division um, based on, on this new society. Uh, the first slaves uh, in the Americas were, were the Indians, um, and they were used for the rice plantation system, but the Indians rebelled, uh, fearing further enslavement and abuses, and soon after, Africans were, were seen as, as even better um, options for slavery than Indians. Um, Two-thirds of, of all people in South, South Carolina by the 1730s were, were indeed African, um, and they worked the the rice plantations utilizing the task system where slaves would uh, have to get a certain allotment of product and the rest of the day uh, would be theirs, uh, mainly because the whites were fearful of catching malaria uh, working in the, in the marshes with the slaves. Uh, Georgia was founded. Uh, the, the Georgia experiment um, set up as a debtor colony, also set up to, to halt um, the Spanish advancement north from Florida. And there was slavery in, in the north as well, um, a small percentage of the population in the north, but they did work on farms and shops, uh, as servants, on the docks, and enjoyed some rights. Um, and we can see the percentage of the population of slaves, and obviously the south is, is far greater. So a new African-American culture emerged because of the, the, uh, the enslavement, um, and it's going to be shaped by African, European, and American influences. Um, it's still obviously a huge part of American society today. Uh, here we see a broadside for the sale of 94 uh, African slaves. And there was some resistance to slavery. In 1712 in New York, slaves burned building, buildings. They, they fought back. They killed some whites. Um, some of them were burned alive as a warning to others. Uh, in South Carolina, there was the Stono Rebellion where uh, slaves marched towards the safety of Spanish Florida, killed whites along the way, shouting liberty. Um, 44 blacks were killed in this uprising. 
Uh, over in England in the late 1600s, uh, after the English Civil War, was the Glorious Revolution, where the uh, new monarch and um, King uh, William and Mary um, are going to um, agree to an English Bill of Rights, which, which guaranteed certain freedoms like rule of law, um, trial by jury, um, restraints on arbitrary authority, and Britain was, was then praised as a balanced constitution. Parliament was powerful as well as as the monarch, and they believe their system prevented tyranny, it prevented uh, control of the Cap by the Catholic Church, um, it prevented barbarism. Um, of course, having slavery throughout the empire um, you know, made liberty far from universal. Uh, in the 16 and 1700s, uh, the Enlightenment was in full swing. Um, John Locke was uh, was one of the leading philosophers, and he wrote two treatise, treatises of government in 1680, and, and those ideas that were echoed by Jefferson in 1776, nearly a century later, about uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, uh, that was taken directly from, from John Locke here, life, liberty, and property. Um, so Locke embodied the, the Enlightenment, and, and his teachings, along with many others, uh, will will have a significant impact in the in the Revolutionary War. Um, here we, here's a picture of Mr. Locke. Love that hair. I'm a little jealous. Um, in the late 1600s and early 1700s, the British governments uh, were preoccupied with events in Europe, which allowed the colonists self-rule. And we'll see rise of colonial assemblies, where where they insisted that they control their own local affairs, much like in Britain with the the House of Commons. But there was not complete freedom. Um, John Peter Zenger in 1735 was uh, accused, uh, well, well, he was arrested for libel for accusing New York governor of corruption. Uh, and as he was defended by Alexander Hamilton, Hamilton asked the jury to judge the accuracy of Zenger's statements, not whether he printed them or not. And it worked, and he was found not guilty. And this idea is going to spread into the colonies. Uh, newspapers should be allowed to print the truth without fear of, of being punished. So that was a uh, important point. Uh, we mentioned before with the Enlightenment, you know, it's applying uh, scientific method of investigation and experimentation to politics, to social life, um, through the study of, of religion. Um, it was critical of established churches. Uh, many Americans during the Enlightenment were deists. They believed that there was a God, but he didn't interfere in the daily lives of men. And at the same time, we'll see amazing uh, accomplishments in the field of science, which, which will be a uh, direct confrontation to, to religion. Isaac Newton discovering natural laws governing the universe. Um, so the Great Awakening of the 1730s and 40s uh, was in response to the Enlightenment. Um, so we're going to see a religious revival. Um, people are, are going to have a movement to become more emotionally and personally um, experienced with Christianity. Uh, ministers like George Whitefield um, are going to help transform uh, religious life in America. New churches sprang up like Baptists, and Methodists, and Presbyterians. And the awakening was supported by the poor and those without the vote, uh, which will cause some to question um, authorities and institutions within America. So this is laying the groundwork for for possible revolution. Jonathan Edwards, another prominent preacher of the Great Awakening. Uh, here on this map we see the French territory, which is most of Canada, the Mississippi Valley, Ohio Valley over here, all the way down to Louisiana, and that's going to conflict with British claims, uh, particularly in the Ohio Valley. So when the Virginia Company is going to um, authorize the Ohio Company to to claim land out in western Pennsylvania, that's where hostilities will erupt between the French and also the British. So the French Empire, as I just said, um, was in danger in this in this war um, over the Ohio Valley. So this is known as the Seven Years' War, and started in 1754. Uh, the British are going to try to remove the French from forts in western Pennsylvania. And the French and Indians uh, were successful in the beginning, uh, attacking the British frontier. Uh, but as the British started funding the Prussian and Austrian armies in Europe against the French, uh, the British were able to overcome the French here in the New World and maintain control of India as well. 
So we're going to see a world transformed. Uh, France uh, gave Canada to the British. Spain, who sided with France, lost Florida to the British. And Spain's going to acquire Louisiana. So with all of this newfound territory, uh, the British government faced problems with the Native Americans. Uh, as British colonists wanted to further uh, spread west of the Appalachian Mountains, um, the Proclamation of 1763 forbade that to try to, to ease the tensions with the Native Americans. Um, but all it's going to do is just further the divide between the colonists and the British government. So Benjamin Franklin's plan, 1754, was the Albany Plan of Union, and this was the idea of an intercolonial legislature uh, where delegates were, were represented from all of the colonies. Uh, but his plan was rejected by, by the colonial assemblies. At this, at this point, before the French and Indian War, uh, most British colonists considered themselves British living in America. So this idea of, of freedom has not firmly been rooted yet. Ben Franklin, and we see this very famous join or die, where you have the 13 colonies, and when they're not united, they're not powerful. All right, that's going to conclude chapter four.